Hello and welcome back to Dragon December here on the Arcane Forge channel. My name's Josh and today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about orange dragons. Now if you've been following Dragon December so far, uh, I've already covered the chromatic dragons in general, a sort of general overview, but I mentioned in that video that there are a few missing dragons. If we look at sort of basic color theory, then we have our primary colors in the Dungeons and Dragons lineup of dragons. We have red and blue, but we're missing yellow. And from our secondary, our tertiary colors, we have green dragons, but we're missing orange and purple. Luckily, I happen to have these fantastic dragon magazines published in September 1982. And inside here, we have an article on that very subject by Alan Lloyd called The Missing Dragons, which cover a first edition take on what these animals might be like. They come with really beautiful artwork and loads and loads of information about how these creatures might operate in combat. Now, they didn't actually have too much about their personalities. We get to learn things about how they might lair, where they might choose to live, what their breath attacks are and what they might do to players, but not necessarily sort of what their behavior is like. And that's a general thing for first edition. This kind of information was much more fleshed out in later editions. And in fifth edition, we have absolutely tons of information about how dragons might behave in D&D. So in this video, I plan to go into depth about how these creatures might live through a homebrew that I've created. If you go and check out my website, again, I mentioned this on my Chromatic Dragons video, but if you go and check out my website, there's a homebrew section, which I'll leave in a little link in my description box, where you can check out my take on these creatures for absolutely free, including their stats and a load of lore about their behavior, their personalities, their lairs, and things like that, that weren't covered in these articles. But my main aim here is to translate these articles into fifth edition adding little bits of fluff here and there where I feel like they're appropriate, where they were missed out, where we could flesh out these dragons more, but I don't really want to create these dragons entirely from scratch because we have a really good piece of information here where the game initially intended these creatures to go. So I'm gonna use these things as a template and then kind of start from there. So today, covering orange dragons, the article says that mating a yellow dragon with a red dragon produces an orange dragon. And orange dragons are also, a lot of the rest of the article talks about this, very, very rare, or perhaps non-existent. And that's because, as I've alluded to previously, um, chromatic dragons are incredibly vain and xenophobic when it comes to all species, really, but including other dragons of different colors. They think that their particular shade is the absolute apex of what a dragon should be, and therefore siring offspring with another type of dragon is not gonna be a great idea for them. So orange dragons are really, really unlikely to occur in the wild. We're told that orange dragons lair in swamps, rivers, or lake areas, frequently living in caves that either open near water, perhaps have an underground stream running through them. And they tend to keep to the shadows since their brilliant coloration would make hiding in normal vegetation very difficult and often begin their days hunting at dusk. As the article carries on, we are kind of explained how these creatures might operate in first edition, which is not much use to us really as although the basic principles are the same, the game has changed an absolute ton. What does still make sense to us though, is that they have a breath weapon of liquid sodium, which Alan Lloyd describes as uh, a dull silver colored stream of sodium, which oxidizes rapidly when exposed to air. He also, also makes note that they have an oily saliva, which serves to prevent premature ignition in the mouth of the dragon. The sodium itself is stored in the digestive tract in a nearly solid state is not liquefied until powerful gastric and esophageal contractions bring it up to the mouth. So essentially this creature's vomiting on you, but you then explode. The article says that victims hit by the sodium stream are drenched, and as the saliva runs off and the sodium is exposed to the air, a victim will be engulfed in a napalm-like flame. We're told that sodium explodes when it comes into contact with water, so if well-meaning friends of the victim try to wash the substance off, the resulting blast will do damage to everyone in a large radius. That the only practical way to prevent the victim from catching fire is to drench him or her in oil to prevent the sodium from contacting the air. 
Now that's really all we get when it comes to what this article describes as orange dragons. We have this wonderful image here as well, which I'll be using as reference. So what does that look like when I turn it into a dragon in game? Well, in terms of the drawing, I wanted to take some influence from this initial image that we have of orange dragons, but the kind of standard of artwork, the style of artwork that, well, that I produce and that has become commonplace in later editions of D&D has seen dragons change quite a lot since this kind of style, but I still want to keep some of these elements. As the result of breeding between a red and yellow dragon, I want to make sure that this creature had a lot of red dragon features. And when I think of red dragons, I think of a lot of horns. They're very, very regal, very self-involved creatures, as all chromatic dragons are, but red dragons in particular are sort of tyrannical. And I want to have this kind of monarch-like crown of horns associated with red dragons, but I also need to dull that down a little bit for orange dragons. They are river dragons after all, and yellow dragons, as we'll find out next week, I have a, a video next Friday where I talk about my homebrew for yellow dragons doing this same process, are aquatic. So I wanted to have a lot of fins and a lot of flared, stretched pieces of skin that indicate that maybe this creature is good at swimming. My initial inspiration for this creature with a kind of you know river-based lifestyle was actually an alligator or a crocodile which I started off showing in the sketch here, and its sort of teeth and its position with its eyes, maybe its nose as well, are quite alligator-like. But as time goes on in the drawing, this becomes way more draconic than that, and the kind of initial reference uh, falls away, but I still quite like what I ended up coming up with here. In terms of elements from the initial drawing, I wanted to make sure that I had those, you, you see those kind of whiskery, noodly bits by the sides of the cheeks or the chin there that the initial drawing has. I thought it'd be very important to also include those. And as well, I was kind of fascinated with the way that the article talked about the sodium being in a solid state almost, somewhere in the digestive tract, which needed to be forced out. Um, and converted into a liquid through pressure alone. So I wanted to make sure that this thing had a quite a large chest, um, which would indicate that it had uh, a huge amount of muscle mass around the chest in particular. And I kind of indicated these large crests here, these ridged crests on the chest, were perhaps where this sodium was stored. And they're heavily prote protected because this thing wouldn't live long if, you know, a single shot from an archer started spilling sodium everywhere and, you know, these things would blow up. So I thought this would be a great, very highly armoured, protected area with a lot of muscle strength. So I wanted to make it quite a prominent feature on this creature, which I didn't mean to make rhyme, but it happened anyway. So I think I'm going to read to you what I came up with for how these creatures will behave as well based on that article from my homebrew. Obviously, as I say, you can read this yourself. This is going to be in my homebrew section on my website. But while I carry on drawing, I thought I'd show you what I'd come up with. So I've said, in terms of orange dragons, these dragons are extremely rare hybrids of the molten red dragon and the almost extinct yellow dragon. Unlike their red chromatic heritage, they tend to stay close to water, relying on the explosive power of their sodium breath attack to annihilate any prey they may face. Their breath attack is one of the most deadly that a dragon can produce, but it's heavily reliant on the innate combustibility and reactivity of the chemical that they spit. So, to prevent premature ignition, they constantly produce a torrent of oil-like saliva to coat the insides of their throats and mouths, which drips and settles on the stagnant water that fills their amphibious lairs. They are equal parts self-obsessed, vain and paranoid, which results in some extremely xenophobic behaviour. Orange dragons have few followers, as they tend to blow up anything that approaches their lair. They prefer to utterly destroy their foes quickly before combat can even commence, having no interest in discovering why an intruder would visit them, instead wanting to remain in solitude and mutter their own plots and plans themselves. Orange dragons don't care for the origins of things, instead claiming any item that travels downstream into their limestone caverns as their own. Furthermore, the orange dragon's self-delusions compel them to rewrite their own memories, convincing themselves that the object was either always theirs, or that they may have invented it, forged it, or otherwise created said object. Anyone stealing or reclaiming a lost object that has found its way into an orange dragon's hoard is seen as stealing not only the dragon's treasure, but also their intellectual property. The, re the insult is maximised, because the orange dragon genuinely convinces itself that they spend perhaps decades creating each object in its hoard, and the fear of losing any part of their life's work 
leaves them in constant sleepless paranoia. Enjoying proximity to water like their yellow bloodline, while displaying an affinity for cave systems and mountains like their red cousins, orange dragons tend to lair in limestone caverns rich with icy cold dripping stalactites, and a constant supply of fresh water which pools in stagnating ankle-high subterranean rivers. They regularly search for food along the lakes and rivers that flow into their caves, obliterating anything they can see as a threat with their explosive sodium breath, and as such their lairs are easier than most to find as the riverbeds and surrounding swamp or marshland areas are pockmarked with craters as evidence of their presence. Now I base their stats pretty solidly on red dragons, they have a lot of influence from those creatures, and it's their kind of the primary solidity that I took as a template in order to create these creatures, with one major exception, obviously their sodium breath, whereas red dragons have a cone of fire, their sodium breath needed to be chemically based, and also it needs to be a stream of liquid and it has these kind of multiple uses. So taking the dragon wormling as a kind of basis here, I said that when it comes to the sodium breath, the dragon exhales a stream of liquid, sodium in a 30 foot line that's five feet wide, that immediately combusts on contact with the air. See in the drawing later on here, I try to incorporate that there. They have this kind of like the dripping slime coming from their mouth and little bits of it are kind of eroding away, exposing bits of sodium to the air, exposing this kind of yellow flame that they're, they're well known for. Each creature in the line must make a dexterity saving throw, taking 4d10 fire damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. So pretty standard, it's a stream of fire essentially. But I then go on to say that alternatively the dragon may choose to choose any point within 120 feet as long as that point is a body of water to spit their sodium breath. And instead of a stream, this results in an explosion, which deals the same damage as above to all those who fail their dexterity saving throw within a 15 foot radius of the impact site. So essentially, they get a choice between a stream of breath, which might affect multiple people in a line, or if there's water around, and again, their lairs are very aquatic, so there's likely to be, unless you are fighting one where it doesn't want to live, or if you're fighting one out in the open, it might, you know, not have too many adventurers standing near pockets of water if it's not in a cave system. But fighting in a cave is definitely going to be this thing's preference. It gets a choice between this stream of fire or a smaller explosion for the same damage in an AOE. But yeah, this was a super simple one. I hope you enjoyed uh, Orange Dragons. I had loads of fun coming up with this and I definitely think I'm going to use these guys. They have a lot of versatility and the kind of circumstantialness of their breath attack being sodium. It's so confirmed. It's such a real world thing with real world chemical understanding. It's not like a breath of fire that, you know, defies logic. It you know, doesn't have fuel to sort of plume along or a beam of lightning coming out of a dragon's mouth that, you know, it's magic. We you know, have this sense of disbelief that we suspend. This is sodium, so players can be really creative with this. As a DM, it gives you a few extra options for how you want this breath attack to operate, but also players who are feeling creative could use create water in this creature's mouth to, you know, maybe make this thing combust in its own mouth, you know, cause explosions close to this creature. You know, if it has this kind of oil liquid, then it's obviously not prepared to be immune to fire damage. Maybe it is on the outside, but if you manage to pour water down its throat, then you can deal extra damage, or if you cause water to uh, drench this creature, maybe it's unable to use its breath attack, things like that. So it gives players a chance to be really creative in combat, and DMs, it gives them a few extra options. So I hope you enjoy using them as well. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure to hit the little like button, maybe favorite this video to refer back to it if you want to remember where you found the link for Orange Dragons, and share it with your group or your DM if you want to fight one of these things, or if you are going to throw them at them, because all of that really, really helps this channel to grow. So thank you so much if you choose to do that. This is only my second video in Dragon December. We have another video coming up on Monday, which is all about the Metallic Dragons. It's another Monster Monday where I go into a lot of depth. So I hope you'll return to enjoy loads more dragon-based content in the run-up to Christmas all this month, all this Dragon December here on the Arcane Forge. So until next time, thank you so much for joining me and happy Monster Hunting. Yeah.